whatever God has promised over your life, you are in the right room. Whatever he's spoken over your life, you are in the right room. I know you came in here and you said, God, I don't know. I, I just heard, I'm just obeying the little unction that I felt in my spirit to be drawn. God is saying, you are in the right room, that he is not forsaking you, that he is not giving up on you, but you are in the right room. You are right here in this moment. So right now, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray over every soul that is in this place that God, whatever you promised them, that God, you will move by your spirit. We believe Jesus. We believe Jesus. You've never forsaken us, Jesus. Yes, Lord. So come alive. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive. In the name of this Jesus, is a house. this is a house of miracles. We bring, we everything. bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name this of Jesus. This is a house. This is a house of miracles. I feel breakthrough happening. Come alive, Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of this Jesus. This is a house. This is the house of miracles. You will walk again. You believe again. Everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of this Jesus. Is the house. This is the house of miracles. Hey, God, I'm, you are my portion. Every need you supply. And I'll never hunger. I know you'll satisfy. When I'm in the desert, you'll always provide. When I call you, will answer. I know, I know you are my portion. You are my portion. Every need you supply. supply. When I'm in the desert, I know, I know you'll satisfy. When I'm in the desert, I'm in the desert. And say, come alive, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name this of Jesus. Ha- this is a house of miracles. I've seen him do too much, so we I know. Bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything, everything in the name of this Jesus. Is ha- this is a house of miracles. I still believe you're moving. I still believe you speak. God, I believe you work. All things for good. And I fix my eyes on heaven. God, I believe your vision. God, I believe you're working. All things for good. Come on, every hand lifted in this place and say, I still believe you're moving. I still believe you're speaking. God, I believe you're working all things for good. I fix my eyes on heaven. God, I receive your vision. God, I believe you're working all things for good. I still, I still believe your moves. I still believe you're speaking. You've been doubting him too long. But God is speaking to you. 
You've been questioning if I'm hearing God, but he is still speaking to you. He is still pulling you. He is still calling you. I still believe you're moving. I still believe you're speaking. God, I believe you're working. All these for so I fix my eyes on heaven. God, I receive your vision. God, I believe your word. All things for good. No, 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 we can't leave this moment. We can't leave this moment. If you're still believing, if you're still believing, then give God a praise. If you still know that he is working all things together for your good, then lift your hands to heaven and receive. Receive what he has for you today. Oh, we're not going to rush out of this posture. God is moving in this place. Strongholds are coming off. Bondages are being broken. Healing is manifesting in this place. Oh, we thank God. We thank God. Thank you for your presence, Lord God. Oh, press in, family, press in. There is an anointing here for every burden to be broken and removed. Do not leave here without coming for what you know God has spoken over your life. Press in, family, press in, press in, press in, press in. Oh, there it is, there it is. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your sweet presence. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace, for your love. We thank you, Jesus, that in you all things are possible. Oh, with us, Lord God, we can mess it up, can't we? But with you, Lord God, all things are possible. And all you ask, Lord, is that we believe. So risk, lift those hands. Lift your voices and just say, I believe. I believe. Lord, we believe you today. We believe you today. Thank you, Father God, for your presence. Thank you, Lord. We believe. We believe. Family, as you could tell, I am neither Pastor Anthony nor Pastor Brenda, but I, I am Leah Pickett, and I am so honored that our pastors would trust me to stand in this space and bring the word of God to you today. I am so grateful for their leadership and that they would create an atmosphere and a church who loves God and loves people, who's not hung up on form and fashion and, and scripts, but that we would sit with the Lord and take his cadence and move when he says move and stand when he says stand. And so if there is anything else you need from God in this moment, I will not move until I feel that everybody has heard exactly what they need from God. Press in, church. There is an anointing here. You heard a powerful testimony this morning when the enemy says, no, 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 no. He runs about as a roaring lion, but he has no roar. He has no bite. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. So he can try to roar all he wants. And when he comes trying to roar, when he takes away your ability to move, to stand, when fear comes and it grips you at your very core, you stand in the power of God and you declare the words of the Lord that who the Son set free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give you praise, Lord. We give you praise. Glory to your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ooh, you can make your way to your seats. You can make your way to your seats. Glory to God. Praise him, praise him. As you're walking past again, my name is Leah Pickett, and I'm just grateful to be able to bring the word to you, to have my awesome husband and my boys, Team Pickett, in the house. <laughs> um, 
If we could just, I didn't mean for you to sit, I meant just walk back to your seat. If we could just stand for the reading of the word of God. I'm so sorry, so sorry. Um, praise team, they, oh, they're gone. Thank you. Y'all got this, y'all got this. And uh, to our online family, we're grateful that you are here with us today. Um, if you could turn in your Bible or in your Bible app to 2 Corinthians 10:12. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. And the word says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, oh, we are so grateful for your presence in this place. Lord, you never disappoint. You met us here. And Lord, we, we release everything that would be a hindrance or an encumbrance for your word to go forth freely and uninhibited. Satan, we put you on notice. You have no place here. And so any assignment that you have set that would hinder God's word from going forth, it is removed. Father God, speak clearly through me. I yield myself fully to you, Holy Spirit, that your word for your people would go forth with power, conviction, and that lives would be forever changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Now go on, take your seat again. <laughs> Ooh, it's summertime, y'all. It is summertime. Oh, only Mr. Terry happy about summer. It's summertime, y'all. I would sing the old song, but I, I want to stay saved on, on the stage. Uh, <laughs> and we're in the middle of a summer series, which is quite fitting. How many of you, summer is your favorite time of year? Oh, no, let me, let me hear it. Is summer your favorite time of year? Now, y'all know I'm an experiential learning experience person, so class participation is required. What are your favorite things about summer? I want to hear them. The beach, vacation, what else? No school, well, uh, <laughs> no school means children at home, but for my teachers, for my teachers, I understand. Barbecue, yes, because that, that baby's daddy barbecues on the regular. I heard, it, I heard it said, and the beach, the pool, all things water are my absolute favorite things. And it could be the lawn sprinkler, I'll take that if I have to, but I love the beach and the pool, and it is absolutely a summertime premiere, right? But summer also brings with it, especially pools and beaches, uh, the need for swimwear, right? It's even been called bikini season. That's not my favorite term. I prefer a tankini or swim skirt season. Uh, and for our gentlemen, maybe not bikini season, but the need to have a beach bod. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Terry. <laughs> and so we might love the water, the beaches, the pools, but the thought of getting in a swimsuit in the summertime might not be our cup of tea. Did you know that swim anxiety or swimsuit shyness is a real thing? It is. Um, and I'm a geek, so I had to look stuff up. I like research. And I found some statistics I want to share. So according to a recent Harris poll, more than 30% of the people they surveyed had not worn a swimsuit in public in more than five years. 20% had not worn one in 10 years. And another 5% said they had never put on a bathing suit, ever. In another survey, 46% of the respondents didn't feel confident in a swimsuit and 33% would rather go to the dentist. Now you might be thinking, Leah, we were all in the presence of the Lord and you just start talking about swimsuits. Where is this going? I'm going somewhere, trust me. <clears throat> My last statistic for now, <laughs> approximately 83% of women are dissatisfied with how their bodies look and 74% of men, you're not off the hook, so why this particular focus? Because according to mental health professionals, summer triggers more body image issues than any other season. And at the root of most 
swimsuit shyness or body image anxiety in general is comparison. So the reason for this particular focus at this particular time is because summer is when we are most heightened and most aware of comparison. And at the surface value, that might not seem like a big deal. It could just be noticing, right? I notice those lovely earrings. I notice those lovely shoes. And if, and if it is just that, then that's fine. But when comparison is left unchecked, and it's not just noticing or being aware, it can wreak havoc in a lot of ways, and particularly when it comes to our confidence. So for all my note takers, this message is called Comparison, a Confidence Killer. So let's dive in. Maybe body image or swimsuit shyness is not quite your thing, but comparison or comparing ourselves can be found in every area. And you could have just gotten a promotion and the next day you're looking at the person ahead of you. Or you could get hired at the same time. And do we not wonder, I wonder how much they're getting paid. Did they get that same, did they get a bonus that I didn't get? We could pull up at a light and it's like you were so in love with your car and then something real loud and big shows up. I don't know about you, but I will be at the grocery store and I am steady like, wow, that's a lot of healthy stuff in their cart. And my cart looks like I'm filling concessions at a football game. <laughs> and let's not mention social media and the role that it has played in comparison. If anything, it has exponentially increased our ability to compare. How so? I'll give you experience. So my baby boy is in the front row, and when he wants to refer to things of my time, he calls them old school. <laughs> Mommy, in old school, did they have TVs? Uh, yes, <laughs> not that old. Um, but in old school, unless you were a family member or a close friend of somebody, you didn't just go in people's houses. That was not really a thing, right? Like, you might know where they live because you rode your bike everywhere, but you just weren't invited into everyone's home and vice versa. But with social media, people take pictures everywhere. Their bathroom, their kitchens. Now I'm all for noticing and admiring a nice countertop. But you can literally see into every area of someone's life on social media in ways that you could not before. And there's this, while we're here, there's this other thing about old school. We never called our friend on the phone and was like, hey, what are you doing? Oh, nothing, girl, what's up? Let me, let me describe this pork chop meal I'm having. We, we didn't describe our food on the phone, but we take pictures of everything we eat and post it. That has nothing to do with this. I was just really interested in that phenomenon. But about comparison, so you're, you're going through your random day, you're scrolling through social media, and you see that you know one of your good friends posted about their date night at Fogo de Chao, and you're like, oh, that's so cool. And your spouse or partner texts you and asks if you want a deluxe double pound, quarter pounder. And <laughs> Enter comparison. <laughs> because it, I say this in jest, but follow this thread, right? It starts with, oh, wow, they went to Fogo de Chao, quarter pounder with cheese. I noticed he also took her to the beach and this exotic island, and I've not been on a vacation in when, and oh, look, they're, they just announced their engagement, and I don't have a date, and you know what, Lord, I don't know if I really like what's going on in my life. And it seems like you're blessing everybody else, and now what's going on with me? Familiar thread? Just that fast, from a simple, what appears to be innocent scrolling and noticing to comparison. And now, questioning. Now, maybe even depression, because... This has been going on for me for a while, and to be honest, Lord, I'm pretty tired of seeing everybody's happy life on social media. I could just unplug, but that would be too much like, right. 
And we don't just compare based on social media. It, it happens so subtly. I mean, there's not anything we don't compare. Hair, height, profession, kids, family. Nothing is spared from being compared. Comparison is a distraction. The enemy wants to use and get us to focus on the shiny things in other people's lives. And then we begin to compare them with what's going on in our own life. And it never seems to fail that it happens at just the time when maybe something is going on in your life. Like all of a sudden, if you're not doing so well, either in your marriage or in a relationship or even with friendships, then everybody else seems super happy and have the best marriages ever, right? Or you're really going through it with your children, but everybody else has these perfect kids, scholar, student, straight A's, and you're thinking about shipping yours off to a detention center. Like, it, it just never seems to fail that the very thing you're going through, it appears as if everybody else has the best life. When we compare, the enemy's goal is to zoom us away from God and what he's doing in our life and get us focused on what we think he's not. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he explained an important principle in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, what we read earlier, and he said, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves. Right there. He said, we do not dare to measure ourselves by themselves or compare ourselves with others is not wise. So... Back to my researching everything, I, I want to know, it, it may sound like with our everyday language, do not and is not wise. Those sound like simple language terms you can't m mess up. But I wanted to know for certain, God, just how unwise is it? And so the word wise here in the Greek is the word sophos. And it means specially enlightened, wise, sharp, or bright. So if you read this verse with that interpretation, it says comparing yourselves among yourselves is not the sharpest or brightest thing to do. Is it not like God to give us some good plain language so we can't mess that up? It's just not a bright thing to do. Well, why would he give us this warning? I mean, if, if what's really the harm in... Wanting more for ourselves, wanting to be different or better. Because the word compare in this text in the Greek is sakrino, which means properly judge together, i.e. closely compare or discriminate. It is literally the picture of two or more standing side by side to thoroughly examine themselves in comparison to each other and then to critically judge who is superior among those candidates. So just take in that image for a moment. Me standing here, someone else standing next to me, and us just comparing, critically judging who is superior. So we might think at face value to compare may not carry harm, but the enemy knows what is at the root of comparison. It never just stops at, oh, that's a, a nice home they have. It starts a spiral, even subconsciously, that will eventually cause us to put ourselves either on the superior side or the inferior side. And that's the trick, to either get you in a side of judgment where you're looking down your nose at someone, well, at least my kids ain't doing it, or I don't know if I'll ever have that. Comparison elevates one and puts another down. And there's nothing about that in the character of God. Comparison fails to recognize the many diverse gifts that exist in the body of Christ because we're too busy either judging them or diminishing them. 
So through comparisons, the enemy is slick enough to manipulate the thing that you use to motivate you. So what does this look like in real life? Now, you know when I have the privilege of being up here, I ask, can we have a Real Talk Sunday? And that just means that I'm going to be a very transparent, vulnerable Leah. And is that okay today? But this particular message, um, it's very dear to me because I fell into this trap of comparison. And I felt the consequence of my confidence being shattered. See, a very younger Leah, the old school Leah, <laughs> um, I was living my best life. <laughs> and I saw my value through my appearance, through my abilities. I never had a problem walking into a room going, hey, y'all, <laughs> who are you? How are you? Uh, the term extrovert, psh, stratosphere. It's always been my thing. And as I got older, wiser, um, and life happened, um, the Lord realized that I did not come from a place of confidence in him. I came through a place of confidence in me. That what I was able to do and how I was growing and moving up in my career and in places was because I was doing it. My confidence came from people telling me about how talented I was or, oh, Leah can do it. I got puffed up. And the Lord is, uh, he's also real plain speaking when he says uh, pride comes before the fall. Because confidence in ourselves is ultimately just pride. I got this, God. Thanks. And as life started to become my teacher, um, the things that I relied on to get ahead were not working. I wasn't feeling as pretty. I wasn't communicating so eloquently. I wasn't able to charm my way into situations. And I found myself in a very lonely, low place. Lord, what happened? Why don't I feel confident in a bathing suit anymore? That's like real talk. That was the, the entire inspiration for those statistics <laughs> was Going on vacation like, hmm, what are we going to wear? <laughs> the things that were easy for me before when I was fueling it was no longer easy. And when I went before God with why is their life looking better? Why am I a bridesmaid in all these weddings? <laughs> Where's my invitation? Where's my happy home? I bought a new house. I thought I was doing really great. It, I'm going to be super transparent. Y'all, it got foreclosed. <laughs> Foreclosure. Do you know how long that stays on your credit report? <laughs> Everything I thought I had because I was creating it, I lost. And I had zero confidence. It's not always about looks and weight. It could be about status. It could be about partnership. You'd be surprised how many people that society deems attractive don't feel attractive. Or what the media would say is an ideal shape, and that person can't stand the way they look in the mirror. It's, it's not always about the external. It's also about what's in here not feeling like you measure up, always feeling like someone's smarter than you, feeling like after you've shared something in a meeting, you're telling yourself inside, that was the dumbest thing. Why did you even say that? Comparisons will cause you to lose confidence in yourself, your ability to achieve your goals, and even in your relationship with God and the ability to believe his word. 
And hence, comparison is a confidence killer. So how did I regain my confidence? Point one, if you're taking notes. Comparison weakens our faith. So Hebrews 10, 35, 36 says, So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Now, this exhortation to have confidence results in a great reward. If I was at a point where I felt like I had zero confidence, what is the reward in that? And then, Lord, why would you tell me to not throw away my confidence and I'm feeling like I don't have any? Because my confidence was in the wrong place. My confidence was not in what God said and who I was supposed to be in him. Our faith and belief in verse 36, that when we've done the will of God, we will receive what he has promised. See, that part was missing for me. I was all about Leah's will. And in order to know the will of God, you have to be in the word of God and spend time with God. But if you're in self-will, then you're spending time with you or you're getting influence from other people, and you're far from that. And so that's the reward that you miss. You don't have confidence in what God said. You can't do his will to get the reward. You've missed all of that. And that is what I did. So you, we can't do the will of God if we don't have confidence and faith in his word. So I want to keep this thread tied tight. When our confidence is shaken, it weakens our faith, meaning at that point where I was at my lowest, it was really hard to believe that God was going to bless me. I mean, it appeared he had taken everything away. See what the enemy is doing here. It started with a comparison. My life doesn't look like someone else's. I'm going to get on my grind and I'm going to go get it. And I'm going to do everything that I can to get it in my power, in my will, away from God's will, away from God's word. I lose confidence. How do I get it back? I got to get back in God's word, understand God's will, and now there can be confidence if I have faith to believe. Familiar scripture here, Hebrews 11, 6 and 7. The thing about familiar passages is we get comfortable in them. Oh, yes, Leah, Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. For I know this. For without faith, it's impossible to walk with and please God. I could say it in my sleep. But I want you to be cautious about when we're comfortable with something. We only grow when we're uncomfortable. So if you get really comfortable with certain scriptures or certain verses or even an aspect of your relationship with God, I challenge you today to get uncomfortable. If you're used to looking at a scripture this way, I want you to turn and look at it from this direction and this direction and this direction to see what else does God have to say. And so for me, this was a familiar text until, for without faith, it is impossible to walk with God and please him for whoever comes near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek him. Verse 7, by faith, with confidence in God and his word, Noah, being warned by God about events not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his family. By this act of obedience, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which comes by faith. This is why the enemy works to get you not to believe, to weaken your faith, because without faith, it's impossible to even walk with God, much less please him. But if the enemy can get you in the habit of disbelief, you won't earnestly and diligently seek him. You won't because you don't believe that he's going to answer your prayers. And when your faith is weakened, you're not going to continue to spend time in a word that you halfway believe or don't believe. Do you see, you, see, you see the trick, right? 
Now, when you're trying to figure things out on your own, look at the second half. By faith, with confidence in God and his word. And then skip down, it says, by this act of obedience. The demonstration of our faith here is described as having confidence in God. And then the text literally preaches itself. The enemy wants to use your comparison to weaken your faith because it will lead to shaking your confidence in God and his word. It's not about the shiny things. The enemy could care less about how much you have because he knows when we all pass, we don't bring it with us. He doesn't mind you having all the wonderful things you should have. As a matter of fact, God doesn't mind you having all the wonderful things in this world. You know why? Because he said, I came that you would have life in abundance to the full till it overflows. David said, I would have fainted if I had not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That is not just waking up and, and barely getting by. No, 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 no. God said, we are, we are his inheritance on this earth. So let's settle right here. It's not about the things. It's about the mind and the heart posture and how using the things can get us to shift in a much deeper spiritual level. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So by this act of obedience, what is the by this? It's referring back to the faith. There had never been rain. <laughs> never been rain. And God told Noah, build an ark because there's going to be a flood. What's a flood? <laughs> Noah had confidence in what God said, no matter how crazy it looked. So the enemy's strategy of using comparison will get us to when God wants to tell you something crazy. To weaken your confidence to believe it. And then it will be impossible to please him. Point two, comparison distorts our true identity. So another familiar passage, and the Lord did this on purpose to help us look at these passages in different ways. Psalm 139, 13, and 14, for I formed, for you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Oh, we are quick most days to be like, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Praise the Lord. Until we're comparing ourselves. God intentionally made us different from others. We are a result of his divine design. Our mannerisms, our insights, the way we see the world. Let's do a quick poll. You got to raise your hands big because I can't see a thing. How many of you have ever been told or heard the phrase, hmm, you said something and they said, I didn't see it like that. And you don't have to raise your hands for this. I'll raise my own. How many times after that did you go, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that? But that unique perspective, that different insight, that new way of seeing things, God putting you specifically to say at that specific time, in that specific moment, and the enemy would love to use other people who are not tapped in to his download to shake you from doing it again. Because the next time you're in that situation, are you ready to just jump out there with all your good ideas? No, not so much. Not if we lack confidence. Not if the person that says something and it gets rewarded for being eloquent or that was a great idea and everyone's patting them on the back and now we're looking at ourselves comparing. I didn't get that reaction when I said it. When we compare ourselves to others, we are simply telling God that he made a mistake. We're despising his most precious creation. And we're in essence saying that, God, this version of me, it's not going to do. I mean, did you not see what's on the gram? Clearly, I need to align more with that. 
It's not better, it's bondage. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So just by virtue of you having the spirit of God within you, there's freedom. Freedom from the comparison and the exact prescription of who you are supposed to be. I believe more than anything that what God wants us to walk away with today is how special each and every one of us are to him. To not consciously or subconsciously fall victim to the damage that a comparison can do. If you're not being your full, authentic self, I am missing out on your gifts. And I'm selfish enough to want all of your goodies. Anytime you've ever looked in the mirror and something that you are just genuinely good at but have ever been made to feel like it was, it was dumb. It was not needed. It was unwanted. I stand here today and ask you to go back to that mirror and pull it back up and say, God put that very thing in me and I love it. <laughs> this is a super materialistic society we're in right now. And whereas technology was put in place to help us, it is, it is also a source of great pain. When you could feel good about yourself one minute, a simple scroll can shoot you right back down. If you're not fully grounded in knowing how precious you are to God. My last point is comparison prevents us from pursuing our purpose. So continuing from our previous text, Psalm 139, 15 and 16, my frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Now that is shouting material right there. Because the psalmist settles any question we've ever had about God's uniquely designed plan for our lives. That God has given each and every one of us a specific and unique, a DNA purpose. Un unprecedented, unparalleled, and unmimicked by anybody else before we were ever formed. Look at this one more time, verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. God is good with plain talk. He is telling you right there before you were born. In your book were written every one of them. So today, uh, next week, five years ago, three weeks ago, every one of them he has written and accounted for. The days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. Family, I beseech you to hear God tell you today you're special. You're loved. You're unique. You have a purpose. There is a good plan for your life. It may look, it may look murky right now. It might be clear as mud. It might not feel all that great. I can feel the, the, the eyes of Leah. You have no idea what happened even at 8 a.m. this morning. Friend, I got you. I have children. <laughs> you have no idea what happened at 8 a.m. this morning. <laughs> and even in that, there's still a good plan. That, that 8 a.m. moment was written in God's book. He's not caught by surprise when we don't have a good day. We might be caught off guard when we hear certain things or things happen, but he's not. 
because he promised in another place he works all things together for our good. So even in those strange moments, those, those hard times, those seasons that don't feel grand to us, they're still a part of God's unique plan. And he doesn't love you any less when bad things happen. As a matter of fact, he loves you even more because he is using you to be a witness and a testimony to others of what perseverance looks like. Of what the reward looks like when you keep your confidence stayed on him. For Shemina to be able to come up here and give a testimony that says, you know what? I don't know what this affliction is, but God, you have a purpose for me in tomorrow's service. And come hell or high water, I'm going to be there. And your power is going to make sure that I am there. And that is a demonstration of God's power when we realize our purpose. The enemy wants you to fall into comparison so that you cannot fulfill that divine purpose for your life. So that you can continue to be a copycat of somebody else. When you are a magnificent, unique version of you. That brings to this world what only you can bring. So you know I always have a Leah life question. That's, that's the what, right? Comparison bad. Comparison kills our confidence. A lack of confidence weakens our faith, distorts our image, and keeps us from our purpose. So, so how, Leah? <laughs> I mean, I could go off all the socials, but is that really living? No, you don't have to do that. Greater is he that is in you. <laughs> the thing you focus on the most is what you'll continually draw to you. I'll say that again. The thing you focus on the most is what you'll continually draw to you. So the enemy would like you to focus on, okay, I won't compare. I'm not comparing. That's nice hairdo, but I'm not going to think anything about it. No, see, comparison is still top of mind. That's the trick. Don't focus on not comparing. You're still focused on not comparing. But shift your focus back to God. Focus on who he said you are in his word. And the thing you focus on is what you'll continually draw to you. Then when you say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, you are focused on the promise of what God said about you. Now when you focus on that I will, that your plans for me are good and, and lead to great success, then that is what you will draw to you. When we focus on what God said about us and what God said we're to do, that is what will draw to us. When we focus on how awesome we are in Christ and the unique gifts and talents that he has given us, that he intricately wove within us. I'm not a weaving person. I only sew merit badges on my boy's Cub Scout sash. But I do know that the act of and the art of weaving is personal. It's hands-on. It takes time. If you've not envisioned God taking delicate time, to weave your life together. Focus on that. That the God who flung the stars in the sky created our vast universe. You can turn a caterpillar into a butterfly. Intricately wove you in every detail of your life. If we could stand to our feet, I want us to I want us to close thinking about one last point on comparison. When we compare, we're ultimately saying, well, Lord, that part is more important than my part. And first Corinthians twelve starting at verse 21 says, 
The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. I love when the Bible does this, but God. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Ultimately, we all need one another. Just as we were created, doing the thing we were created to do. So let's demonstrate our faith by making these confessions. Repeat after me, please. Father, that was a test. Father, <laughs> thank you for the ways you made me unique and divinely different. Forgive me for the times I've compared myself with others. You specially made me to fulfill a role no one else can fulfill. I declare, I declare that what I am, I am by the grace of God. You didn't make any mistakes in the way you made me. I accept what you've made me to be. And in you, Lord, I will fulfill all you created me to do. I declare this by faith. In Jesus' name, give God a hand clap of praise. In order to truly be free from comparison, you have to have been able to start that confession by saying, Father, and knowing you are talking to your Heavenly Father. And if there's anyone in here that's watching online that didn't confidently call out to your Heavenly Father and know with assurance that He heard you, we can fix that today. If we could close our heads, <laughs> close our heads. Lord have mercy. It's a Sunday, y'all. <laughs> Do not close your head. <laughs> so you got to be able to laugh at yourself sometimes, right? <laughs> we could close our eyes and bow our heads and pray this prayer together. Jesus, I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I admit I'm a sinner and that only your blood can cleanse me of those sins. I believe you died on the cross, you rose from the grave, and now sit at the right hand of the Father, interceding for me. I declare you are my Lord and Savior. I am saved in Jesus' name. Oh, come on, let's praise God for those who have prayed that prayer. And if you did pray that prayer for the first time, please complete that Connect card that Shamina talked about earlier. We want to pray with you and we want to support you in your new walk as a believer. And for those of you that are already members of the household of faith, happy Sunday, church. Let us continue in worship. Good morning again, church. Good morning. Good morning. Just let's give it up one more time for uh, our dear Leah. Thank you. Thank you for that word. I mean, tell you, comparison. You talk about social media, y'all. I stayed off of it for about 19 years. Um, I really did. I just joined in April, and I'm learning why I stayed off of it for 19 years. But um, think we, we're thankful for serving a God that 
gosh, our confidence truly is secure in who he is, right? Um, I used to be confident in the fact that I'm a, I'm a great mom and, and I'm a great wife and I'm Godfrey's wife and there's a certain confidence that comes along with that. But even more than that, I am the daughter of the Most High God. I am the daughter of a king. I am the daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? Like, I am created by the same God that created the entire universe, right? And so are you. So, I mean, if, listen, I'll tell you what. <laughs> um, I'm inviting you at this um, at this time for, to continue our worship in the giving of our tithes and our offerings. But also um, just taking this moment to speak to you coming from the aspect of being the outreach director here at Celebration. My husband and I, um, we are the outreach directors here at Celebration. And really all that means is we coordinate, right? That outreach is just not a department or a section or a title to be had. Outreach is who we are as a church. This is what we do. It is our lifestyle. It is a value. Um, and that is something that we take very seriously. So this is not the awkward moment in church. I'm not getting up here. We, we don't do fundraisers, right? That's not what we do. So be keeping it completely real with you. Real Talk Sunday. We're going to be okay as a church. If you give, you give. If you don't, you don't. We're still going to be okay because God is our source, right? And everything else is a resource. So I will never come up here and pit some sort of, oh, we have to do this and we have to do that. No, it's an invitation. You know what's going on in your life. You know how good God's been good to you. You know what you have. You know what you don't have. What I can say to you and what I can encourage you with is that, like you said, I like good things, we all like good things and shiny things, but my getting never outdoes my giving. Know that about me. When you see me and you see wonderful things, know that my getting never outgives. Like, you know what I mean? And it just, it just, my proportion of giving is because everything that I have, I understand that if it had not been for the Lord, I wouldn't have a thing and nothing. It could be shiny, it could be cute. No U-Haul going behind me when I'm going to heaven. So I love this church, right? I love that I'm understanding, and that's what I was thinking about yesterday. Like I said, before that pain came, I said, Lord, what do I really want them to know about what we do here in outreach? For us, it's not just about, you know, you hear that word charity, and sometimes when you think charity, you feel sorry a little bit. Maybe not y'all, I'll talk about me. Back in the days, if I think about charity, I'm like, oh, I feel bad for those people, and I should do something about it. And then as you mature and you grow in Christ, you realize charity, in the truest sense of the word, as the Bible says, it's about love. That is why we give. That is why we partner with the um, schools that we do right? Because you, you just have that love in your heart. I'm a parent. So it comes to the point that now as a mommy, if I'm thinking that my kids are being fed and my kids are eating, I think that this is summertime right now. And one of the schools we partner with, the children don't have access to food as they normally would because there is no school. And school lunch and breakfast is how they get their nourishment. So then what happens when we're on break? Right? They're kind of left out there. But that's where we step in as a church as much as we can to be able to give and to be able to fill in that gap. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's not 100%, but we're trying. But we're trying not because we feel sorry for anybody. We're trying because we're grateful and because we have love. And we know that the love that Jesus gives to us that we're able to sustain our own families that's something we want to share. So I encourage you now to just understand that is where you're giving goes. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for using the app right now. We have lots of ways to give. The ushers will pass the envelope um, around. We have online app, you know, just any, we have various ways that you can give and you can share. And if you are interested in learning more about outreach and how we can support um either something you care about because maybe you know about things out there that we still don't know about that maybe we can help you partner with or just how you can partner with us. So um, with that, I'll just bless the offering. 
Father God, we thank you and we praise you, Lord God, for being Jehovah Jireh, Lord God, for being our provider, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that you're the provider of more than just things, Lord God. You're the provider of peace. You're the provider of healing. You're the provider of hope and faith and belief, Lord God. You're the provider of community, Lord Jesus. And we thank you right now for every household represented, Heavenly Father, you know. You know, like you know, Lord God, what their situation is, Lord Jesus. I thank you right now, Lord God, for even touching the hearts of those that have come a long way. You may not even have what you would want, but you had more that you had before. And so I just thank you right now, even for that, Lord God, that we are taking steps, Lord God, from glory to glory, that we're doing better than we did before. I thank you, Lord God, for speaking to our hearts even now that truly, Lord God, we know that what we give is going to be pressed down, shaken together and running over, Lord God. I thank you for the overflow. I thank you for the abundance that's going to fall upon this house, Lord God. And the abundance is coming with obedience. The abundance is not linked to an amount, Lord God, but the abundance is linked to the heart posture. Lord God and saying Lord we are obedient and Lord that we are here and we're giving in love Lord God not out of pity we're giving in love Lord God because you are great and so we thank you for that and we bless every family here Lord God that there should be a family that there is no lack Lord God that my brother and my sister to the left and to the right of me that if there is something that you need that I am here Lord God we are here for each other because you are resting and ruling and abiding in all of us, Lord God. So thank you, Holy Spirit, for providing day after day, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, I pray. So with that, thank you so much for giving. Uh, may the Lord bless you, keep you, shine his goodness upon you. May his countenance be with you. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Happy Sunday and take care.